Hey everyone, today we're talking about sedimentary rocks. And this is the first video in a playlist of videos that I'm gonna have on my channel about sedstrat. So in this video specifically, we'll be going over the major classes of sedimentary rocks like clastic or detrital versus chemical and biochemical rocks. And then also we'll talk about terms like exogenetic and endogenetic, intrabasinal and extrabasinal, and allogenic and orthogenic. And we'll talk about the difference between those terms and then we'll also introduce the fabric and structure of a sedimentary rocks and how they differ from igneous and metamorphic rocks and why they're super important in the way that they differ from the other types of rocks for storing and transporting fluids. And then lastly, we'll go over a general classification of the major sedimentary rocks that you probably already know, like conglomerates, sandstones, shales and mudstones, limestones, and other non-clastic chemical rocks and in later videos in this series, we'll get more specific into the classification and we'll talk about what it's based on, grain size versus other factors for chemical rocks, and we'll get into all of that. So for this video, it's more of an introductory video, and let's go ahead and start with what is a sedimentary rock, or in general, what's a sedimentary deposit? So a sedimentary deposit is a body of material accumulated at or near the Earth's surface under the low temperature and pressure conditions characteristic of Earth's surface compared to beneath Earth's surface like igneous and metamorphic rocks. And in general, there are two major ways that rocks can form at Earth's surface. The first one is by the breakdown and redistribution of pre-existing rock fragments. And then of course, the compaction with burial and cementation, which we'll talk about in upcoming videos, as well as this one. And also number two, the chemical precipitation of minerals and rocks from solution. So these are the two major ways that rocks can form at Earth's surface and they can be broken up into these two major classes. Exogenetic, those that form by the breakdown and redistribution of pre-existing rock fragments, and endogenetic, those that form within the place that they or accumulate within the place that they form. And those are things like chemical precipitations because they're accumulating right there where they're precipitating from the solution. And the breakdown and redistribution of pre-existing rock fragments is happening with transport of those fragments from somewhere else. And so it's exogenetic. So it's coming from somewhere else and then it's accumulating somewhere that it wasn't formed. To give some examples of this, we know that exogenetic rocks include things like clastic conglomerates, which contain gravel, pebbles, cobbles, and we'll explain all those grain size terms in the very next video in the series. But basically it has all these clasts from previous rock fragments that therefore defines it as being exogenetic as well as we call it clastic or detrital sometimes because, well, it has clasts and they weren't formed in the place that they they accumulated, <laughs> they were transported there. But we also sometimes use the word detrital, which is very similar to clastic. It just means that the rock contains detritus, which is kind of similar to saying it contains clasts of previous rock fragments or just other stuff that was transported and accumulated down at the bottom sediment of whatever basin it accumulated in and made the deposit that it eventually made. And so detrital and clastic are similar terms, but as you'll see in a second, I'll explain why clastic isn't necessarily ideal sometimes because when we're talking about other types of rocks like igneous rocks, they can contain clasts but not be clastic or exogenetic. So it's a little bit of a confusing term and I'm going to explain that in a second. But in general, endogenetic rocks, those that form in the place that they accumulate, are things like gypsum or rock salt, any sort of evaporite deposit, many carbonates like limestone, but sometimes limestone can be detrital, so we'll get to that as well. And then also other chemical precipitating minerals like iron hydroxides, manganese oxide, sometimes silica in the form of chert can precipitate from solution. So anything that's precipitating from solution is endogenetic. And this is where the similarities to igneous rocks kind of come into play. Because you might think that precipitating out of solution is different in its process to precipitating out of magma, but it's really not. Rocks that precipitate from magma or crystallize out of magma like igneous rocks do are really no different than chemical sedimentary rocks. We can see a couple examples over here. One is obsidian, this bottom center picture here. This rock looks glassy and the reason for that is that it's 
it's glass <laughs> and it forms from cooling really quickly at our surface when lava is exploded out of volcanoes and what we notice about the obsidian in this picture is that it doesn't have clasts and so that seems to make sense with so far what we've seen about chemical versus plastic rocks however the one on the left over here does have clasts. And you might think that, oh, does that make it clastic if we were trying to define it based on sedimentary terms? But no, it actually wouldn't be defined as clastic. How these clasts formed is very different than how clastic sedimentary rocks form. Instead of clasts tumbling down into a basin and then accumulating at the bottom of that basin and being compacted and cemented and lithified, they are instead precipitating out of solution, therefore are chemical. The clasts, though, are are very visible in this rock because some of these materials decided to start crystallizing or precipitating from the solution or magma before the others or the fine-grained ground mass. And because these big clasts started to precipitate sooner, they had a longer time to grow into big, large crystals, and the finer-grained ground mass crystallized later and only had a very short time to really harden because it cooled so quickly at that point that the ground mass just became fine-grained because it didn't have time to grow large crystals and therefore you get this really clastic looking rock but it's not actually clastic and it's actually termed porphyritic if you want to know more about igneous rocks and the terminology behind the textures and all of that i actually have a whole playlist about igneous rocks and igneous petrology and you can check that out i'll link it up here in the right corner for you but with all that igneous comparison aside let's talk a little bit about the textures that result from exogenetic formation of sedimentary rocks versus is the endogenetic or chemical crystalline formation of sedimentary rocks. Obviously, we can imagine that clastic or detrital or exogenetic rocks are forming from grains that are just being compacted closer and closer together, but obviously have this framework structure of grains and pore space, whereas those that form from precipitation from solution do not have pore space because that's just not how crystal growth directly from solution works. In fact, they have a more interlocking crystalline granular fabric as shown down here in the bottom picture, whereas those that are detrital have this pore space grain framework. And yeah, sometimes cement can precipitate in those pore spaces or other smaller grains can come and occupy those pore spaces, but this is still very different from the interlocking granular structure of chemical or indigenetic rocks. And what we can see is that results in some majorly different structures based on how these rocks formed. And structures and textures are just different in basically scale, guys. So if you don't know, textures typically refer to very small scale features like internal framework of rocks that maybe you might need a microscope for, or at least a hand sample of the rock, whereas structures define very large scale features, like for example, sedimentary structures. We can see in this rock, there's some cross bedding. That's typically a structure. And structures are very rarely examined in hand sample or even seen in hand sample and you kind of have to look at a big outcrop to see structures they're just larger scale and what we see is that the structures can be vastly different because of the way these rocks form so differently for example in the exogenetic or clastic or detrital examples because they have this grain and pore framework the rocks can be stratified they can be cross bedded they can be rippled they can have all these sedimentary structures which we'll talk about in a whole separate video and indigenetic rocks, on the other hand, actually cannot and do not display these types of sedimentary structures that we see in detrital rocks. Instead, they can be either amorphous, like blobby in structure, or crystalline, as we see in this halide over here. But they do not show large-scale sedimentary structures that we can use for determining depositional environment, like I've talked about many times in my depositional systems playlist. But moving on from exogenetic and endogenetic, let's talk a little bit about some different terms now. So here we can see sedimentary rocks can also be classified based on their provenance or place of origin. And the terms we use to classify rocks in this way is intrabasinal or extrabasinal. Intrabasinal is exactly what it sounds like. Those that formed in the basin in which they accumulated when we're talking about sedimentary rocks or just grains and those elements that will eventually make up the sedimentary rock and extrabasinal is also exactly what it sounds like. Those that formed outside of the basin and were transported to the basin by waves, currents, or other transport mechanisms. 
And obviously this sounds a lot like our previous two classes we talked about. Exogenetic rocks like conglomerates and sandstones would be extra basinal because their grains form outside of the basin and they're transported into the basin, which is where they accumulate and eventually lithify into rocks. Whereas things like evaporites are precipitates that form within the basin that they then accumulate in and form their deposit in. But a fossiliferous marl or limestone would technically be detrital because those shell fragments or fossil fragments are not forming from precipitation directly on the seafloor and they're not interlocking grains like chemical precipitates like we would expect from the previous slide when we talked about textures. These fossil fragments more so represent rock fragments that fall to the seafloor and then form a grain pour framework that eventually compacts and is cemented together and lithified into a rock more similarly to those detrital conglomerates and sandstones than it is to things like evaporite deposits. So how would we classify this fossiliferous marl? Well, technically it is interbasinal because it did accumulate in the basin in which its components formed. Nothing had to transport the fossil fragments to that basin. They were there, but they had to fall as detritus to the seafloor and get compacted and buried by other sediment and cemented and lithified together. So it's not so black and white between these two terms, detrital and chemical, or clastic and chemical, or exogenetic and endogenetic, and intrabasinal and extrabasinal. Even conglomerates and sandstones, guys, can have chemical components, like their cement, for example. What is it that's cementing them together? Well, if we remember from that poor framework we talked about, they do have grains and they have pore spaces. But in those pore spaces, eventually, precipitation usually occurs. And this is the chemical precipitation of cement within those pore spaces to hold the rock together. And that is chemical formation. So how would you define this hybrid? type of rock then if it's got clastic grains and chemical cement holding it together. Well, because of this hybridization of the two types of formation, we typically go by relative contribution of clastic versus chemical sediments. So if the rock contains mostly clastic sediments like gravel and conglomerates or sand and sandstones or silt and siltstones, then we're typically going to define it as clastic. And then if it's mostly clay and mud from weathering, we just say it's a mudstone or shale. And if it's mostly or exclusively material that precipitated directly from solution. It is chemical or biochemical, typically rocks such as limestones, dolostones, evaporites, iron minerals and iron stones, phosphorides or phosphate minerals, shirts, and similar silicious rocks that form directly from solution. And evaporates, guys, if you're unsure, we'll talk more about later in the playlist, but they're just things like gypsum, for example, as shown here to the bottom right, calcite and rock salt, which is in geology, called halite as its mineral form, and evaporite deposits are most common in evaporitic environments where a lake, typically a perennial lake or playa lake, is sometimes there and then evaporates away, and then it's there again and evaporates away, and all these cycles of evaporation build up these chemical precipitates because what's evaporating is pure water. It leaves behind its salts because those ions are too heavy to evaporate, so that's what precipitates precipitates from solution upon evaporation when all the water is going away and these ions in solution become very super saturated and they're like, we can't do this anymore. We got to get out of solution. We are too saturated. But again, guys, we'll talk about evaporites in later videos in this playlist. And we'll talk a lot more about carbonates, if you're wondering, in the upcoming carbonate playlist. But moving on from all that self-promotion, let's get into why sedimentary fabrics are so fabulous. Basically, clastic sedimentary rocks differ from igneous and metamorphic rocks in that they have porosity and permeability. And you might think that this makes total sense because we did just talk about how clastic sedimentary rocks have this poor grain framework because of the way that the grains are previous rock fragments and they're redistributed and then accumulate and are then compacted and cemented together. And that makes sense. Whereas 
Other rocks like igneous rocks or chemical sedimentary rocks precipitate directly from either solution or magma, and that creates this interlocking granular framework that does not have any pores or pore spaces. And the same thing with metamorphic rocks. Obviously, when it's put under that much heat and pressure, there's not going to be any pore spaces. So these classic sedimentary rocks are very special in that they have this ability to store and transport fluids in those pore spaces. This makes them great reservoirs for natural gas, petroleum, and water. However, like we did mention, a solution that fills these pore spaces has ions in it that react with the sediment grains and might precipitate out minerals within those pore spaces, creating a cement that does exactly what its name is and cements the material or the grains together and therefore greatly reduces the pore space available for the storage and transport of fluids. However, sometimes these reactions of the solutions that are in contact with those grains can also cause the dissolution of some material that can then be transported away in fluids. Sometimes there's dissolution, sometimes there's precipitation. It really depends on the materials involved. But this is why it's so critical that instead of just focusing on the solids that got transported and accumulated in some basin somewhere and got compacted and lithified to make the classic sedimentary rocks, instead of just focusing on those, we also really have to consider the composition of the solution that was involved in where these sediments accumulated and formed, because that can heavily affect the composition and the internal framework of that sedimentary rock. And when we're trying to look at a sedimentary rock and reconstruct its depositional history and its diagenesis, we would only be looking at half of the equation if we only considered the solid fraction, we also have to consider the solution in which it accumulated. Because once things are buried, guys, we can't see what's going on, but we know there's tons of reactions going on because water, guys, in the ocean, in lakes, any water is not just H2O. It has tons of ions in it, and it's going to do all these sorts of reactions, and we have to understand it to understand the diagenesis or basically the burial history of any sedimentary deposit. The last set of terms that we typically divide sedimentary rocks or actually sedimentary minerals into is allogenic minerals that make up sedimentary rocks are those that formed elsewhere and transported to the area or basin in which the deposit accumulates. And again, this seems very similar to clastic or detrital material, whereas orthogenic minerals formed in situ, which are typically chemical or post-depositional precipitates, like again, than what we've talked about in the previous terminology. I'm just mentioning these terms so you know that all of these types of terms can be used. And if you see them in the literature, this is what they mean. Yes, they're very similar to exogenetic and endogenetic and extrabasinal versus intrabasinal. So yes, they're very similar. These are just extra terms you probably need to know. And we can actually separate these categories further to determine which orthogenic minerals form during or after accumulation. So remember, Orthogenic minerals are those that form in situ or precipitate directly from solution. And if they form during the accumulation of the deposit, they're called syndepositional. And if they form after, they're called postdepositional. And understanding whether we're looking at syndepositional versus postdepositional mineral precipitates is very important for both completely chemical rocks as well as just chemical cements that are within clastic rocks holding the grains together. Similarly, we can also separate minerals in a rock based on whether they precipitated directly at a solution in a pore space or they were replacing a mineral that was already present there, but reactions caused that mineral to convert to something else and become replaced. So there are different types of chemical precipitates. And again, guys, we'll talk about these in later videos. And then allogenic minerals, those that formed elsewhere and were transported to the basin in which they accumulated, can be broken up into three different categories based on the processes by which they form. The first one is by weathering. So clay minerals often form by weathering. Basically, primary minerals are weathered or partially dissolved, and clay minerals or secondary clay minerals form because of this weathering of the primary minerals. This happens a lot with igneous materials like feldspar minerals, and I talk a lot more about that process, the formation of secondary clay minerals from weathering in my microbial weathering video part one 
one, which I will link up here in the right corner for you if you want to check it out. And then the next category we have here for allogenic minerals is those that formed in sedimentary environments, basically sedimentary detritus or rock fragments that were transported to a basin. And again, formed into a detrital sedimentary rock. So sedimentary detritus can be contrasted to subterranean detritus or igneous and metamorphic detritus, which can contribute to the formation of detrital sedimentary rocks, but these rocks originally formed in a subterranean environment. And again, guys, like I mentioned earlier, after burial of sediments in the basin that they're accumulating in, a lot of things happen during the compaction and cementation and lithification of those materials. And all of these burial and preservation processes are defined as diagenesis. And during diagenesis, especially when temperature is raised, many of the reactions between the components in the water and the grains begin to occur because the temperature rise helps overcome energy barriers of those reactions and allows those reactions to occur because they're thermodynamically favorable and now we can get over the activation energy barrier because we have enough heat so this is the reason that temperature so heavily affects and alters mineral composition and sedimentary and basically any deposit and even in chemical and biochemical sediments diagenetic transformations can heavily alter the composition especially if temperature is raised just like we talked about earlier recrystallization and replacement of the primary minerals can occur not only with these pore space water interactions but also in chemical interlocking rocks. So lastly, I just want to introduce the major types of rocks that we'll be talking about throughout this playlist, and that is for clastic rocks, conglomerates and breccias, sandstones, siltstones, and shales, and then for chemical rocks, limestone and dolostone, and other non-clastics like those we mentioned earlier, turds, iron minerals, phosphate minerals, evaporites, etc. So we'll talk about all of these types of rocks in a much more detail in later videos in this playlist. But but before I let you guys go, I want to just point out, because you're probably wondering, well, sure, we're going to study all these rocks, but how important are they really? So I point out here the most important by relative abundance, sedimentary rock types. And these are shales, sandstone, and limestone, which make up about 95% of all sediments on earth. So these are of ultimate importance to understand. However, these relative abundances and relative importances have changed drastically through geologic time. And so we'll discuss how this has changed through geologic time and basically sediments through Earth's history in a much later video in this playlist, but it will be coming. So check out my channel if you want to see that. Maybe it's out by the time you're watching this. And that is all I have for today's introduction to sedimentology and stratigraphy video. And if you want to know what's coming up in this playlist or what's maybe out by the time you're watching this we also have all these videos here where in the next one we'll go over basically grain sizes and how we classify rocks based on grain sizes then we'll talk about roundness angularity surface texture and what it means in terms of the history of that rock and how we can determine depositional environment i encourage you to pause and read through this if you'd like to go through it more slowly or just go check out my channel in case those videos are already up and my references for this video by the way are are the Sedimentary and Stratigraphy book by Sam Boggs, as well as Sedimentary Rocks by F.J. Pettyjohn. And you can check both of these books out at the links in my description below, as well as any other minor and supporting references. They are always linked in my description below, and I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I can't wait to see you guys in the next one. Bye!